on World News Tonight. Deadly Blasts, a series of blasts rock Russian airbase in Annex Crimea. Tonight, President Zelensky gives a strong address. Travel Chaos, passengers face chaotic trips as flight disruption sweeps Europe. Tonight, find out the cause. Drowning Korea, residents in shock over unusual floods as torrential rain drenched the south. And honoring a star, Australian landmarks glow in pink to honor Olivia Newton-John. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we begin tonight's broadcast with the latest updates in the war in Ukraine. A Russian airbase near seaside resorts in Annex Crimea Peninsula was rocked by a series of explosions that Moscow said were detonations of started ammunition, not a result of any attack. A series of loud explosions rocked a Russian airbase near seaside resorts in the Annex Crimean Peninsula on Tuesday. Witnesses said they heard at least 12 blasts, and video showed a plume of smoke jetting into the sky. Crimea's health department, along with a Russian governor of Crimea, said at least one civilian had been killed, but the cause of the blast remained unclear. Russia's defense ministry brushed off the idea that there had been an attack and claimed the blast came from detonations of stored ammunition. Crimea, a holiday destination for many Russians, was annexed by Moscow from Ukraine in 2014 and used in February as one of the launch pads for its invasion. On Tuesday, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky did not directly mention the blast in his daily video address, but said it was right that the people were focusing on Crimea and reiterated Kyiv's position that Crimea would have to be returned to Ukraine. The presence of Russian occupiers in Crimea is a threat for all of Europe and to the global stability. The Black Sea region cannot be a safe place while Crimea is occupied. If Ukraine were to acknowledge it had attacked territory that Russia sees as its own, Moscow could accuse Kyiv of crossing a red line. Today, Meanwhile, in Washington, U.S. President Joe Biden made a move of his own, formally endorsing Finland and Sweden's ascension to NATO, the most significant expansion of the military alliance since the 1990s. Our alliance is closer than ever. It is more united than ever. And when Finland and Sweden bring the number of allies to 32, we'll be stronger than ever. Stronger than ever. The two Nordic countries applied for NATO membership in response to Russia's February invasion of Ukraine. Putin thought he could break us apart when this all started. He believed he could break us apart, in my view, weaken our resolve. Instead, he's getting exactly what he did not want. Moscow has repeatedly warned both countries against joining the alliance. Now, Europe's travel industry is in disarray amid strikes, lost luggage, soaring prices. Millions of passengers who have endured a chaotic summer getaway as flight cancellations and disruptions have swept across Europe. Baggage chaos, endless queues, cancelled flights. Scenes like this are common at European airports this summer. We were trying to get home to Denmark and um, our flight was cancelled. So what's causing the travel nightmare? Strikes and staff shortages are forcing airlines to cancel thousands of flights. Staff are asking for better working conditions and big pay increases after sweeping job cuts and pay cuts during the pandemic. In Spain, Ryanair workers walked out for several days in July causing disruption at many airports. Lufthansa Pilots Union is demanding a 5.5% raise this year and automatic inflation compensation going forward. The German airline was forced to cancel more than 1,000 flights on July 27th when its ground staff went on strike. In June, Norwegian Air agreed to a 3.7% pay rise for pilots, among other benefits, in a sign of what other airlines may have to offer to avoid labor strife. Airlines have cut thousands of flights from their summer schedules to cope with the disruptions. Major airports including London's Heathrow and Amsterdam's Schiphol have imposed a cap on passenger traffic. 
That's led to British Airways halting ticket sales on some popular short-haul flights to destinations like Paris, Milan and Amsterdam until mid-August. Airports and airlines are scrambling to hire more workers from pilots, security, border control staff to baggage handlers after many left during the COVID-19 crisis. Amsterdam's Schiphol is operating with 10,000 fewer workers than before the pandemic. Paris's Charles de Gaulle and Orly airports need to fill 4,000 jobs, mainly in security, maintenance and retail. That's according to airport operator group ADP and the CDG Alliance. Industry executives say these jobs are tough to fill since the work is often physically demanding and relatively low paid. Training new hires and getting them security clearance to work at airports also takes months. The local government of South China's island province of Hainan, which is suffering a COVID resurgence, has taken targeting measures to curb further spread of the virus and ensure sufficient supplies of daily necessities. China's Henan Island has turned from a tourism hotspot to a COVID epicenter. Cases have recently soared and snap lockdowns have left tourists stranded there. State media says more than 170,000 are stuck. On Tuesday, authorities locked down at least nine cities and towns, a population of about 7 million, becoming one of several Chinese regions battling outbreaks after seeing very few cases in the past two years. Those include Xinjiang and Tibet in the West. Henan has reported more than 1,800 infections in August alone. The sharp increase in cases comes as interest in tourism picks up after China slightly relaxed limits on domestic travel. State broadcaster CCTV showed footage in Henan of dozens of people queuing up to receive COVID-19 swab tests and several cordoned off areas under lockdown in the provincial capital, Sanya. The curbs are in line with China's dynamic COVID-0 policy that aims to stamp out outbreaks as soon as possible. President Joe Biden has set in stone a bill aimed at bolstering America's chip making industry to ensure a steady and stable supply and to ease external dependence. President Joe Biden has signed a landmark bill into law aimed at providing 52.7 billion U.S. dollars in subsidies for U.S. semiconductor manufacture and research. Calling the bill a once-in-a-generation investment in America, Biden stressed during the signing ceremony Tuesday that the future is now going to be made in America. We are the United States of America, a singular place of possibilities. I'm not going to go sign the Ships and Science Act. And once again, I promise you, we're leading the world again for the next decades. The Biden administration underscored that the legislation, which is now called the Trips and Science Act, is critical for U.S. national security in competing with China, as well as reducing America's dependence on Taiwan and South Korea for critical technologies. The legislation also provides a 25 percent investment tax credit for chip facilities. The U.S. Commerce Department has yet to establish guidelines for evaluating grant applications, and it's unclear when projects will be financed. The White House explained Tuesday that numerous companies spurred by the bill have already announced over $44 billion in new semiconductor manufacturing investments. Meanwhile, Beijing opposed the bill. The Chinese embassy in Washington expressed Beijing's firm disapproval of the bill, describing it as, quote, reminiscent of a Cold War mentality. The FBI conducted a search for former U.S. President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago, Florida residents allegedly looking for classified documents he took from the White House before leaving office. Now, Donald Trump tried to tell the news that the FBI had searched his Florida estate to his benefit, citing the investigation in text messages and emails soliciting political donations from his supporters. Republicans moved to turn the FBI's search of former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate into a campaign issue on Tuesday, vowing to probe what they alleged was political interference at the Justice Department. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy tweeted, quote, when Republicans take back the House, we will conduct immediate oversight of this department, follow the facts, and leave no stone unturned, telling Attorney General Merrick Garland to, quote, clear your calendar. As for Trump, he and some Republican campaign committees tried to turn the news to their benefit 
citing the investigation in text messages and emails soliciting political donations from his supporters. Trump's followers were rallying outside his Mar-a-Lago estate Tuesday, moved by the former president's claim of harassment. What the FBI just did was totally unacceptable. Kyle Kondik is a political analyst at the University of Virginia Center for Politics. He says Trump and Republicans are creating a narrative amid an information vacuum. Well, look, I mean, Trump is great at playing the victim. Um, and again, Trump is going to be able to say more about this and frame this in, in ways that I don't think the FBI necessarily will, um, because the FBI, DOJ, is, are, they're typically pretty closed lip about the, or tight lipped about these things and into the vacuum of, of information about what happened. Trump and Republicans fill that vacuum by basically casting this as some sort of witch hunt. The unprecedented search of the home of a former president on Monday marks a significant escalation of the federal investigation into whether Trump illegally removed classified records from the White House as he was leaving office in January of 2021. A federal law called the U.S. Presidential Records Act requires the preservation of memos, letters, notes, emails, faxes, and other written communications related to a president's official duties. Any search of a private residence would have to be approved by a judge after the investigating law enforcement agency demonstrated probable cause that a search was justified. It almost certainly would be approved by FBI Director Christopher Wray, a Trump appointee, and his boss, Attorney General Garland, who was appointed by President Joe Biden. Mitchell Eppner, a former federal prosecutor, says the Justice Department wouldn't have moved without a good reason. They believe that there is something very important that they're investigating that would have major consequences if proven. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, heavy downpours continue to pound South Korea. Homes and businesses flooded, cars abandoned in the streets. Authorities issued a level 3 warning aimed at preventing further damage. Torrential rain has been pounding the capital region in South Korea since Monday. At times during Monday night, parts of the capital area received more than 100 millimeters of rain per hour, while some districts like Dongjaku received up to 422 millimeters overnight. In response, heavy rain warnings have been issued for most central regions as well as the provinces of Gangwon-do and Chungcheong-do. During the day on Tuesday, rain was falling at 20 to 30 millimeters per hour on average in the capital region. But the rain got heavier as the day passed. It is expected that on Tuesday night, around 100 to 200 millimeters will fall in the capital region and Gangwon-do province, but some areas could even see up to 300 millimeters. About 100 to 200 millimeters also fall in the rest of the central region in Gyeongsangbuk-do province. But the amount of rainfall, which will continue until Thursday, will vary drastically by region. Due to the rain, at least nine people have been confirmed dead and six are missing. Over 440 people were also displaced from their homes and have taken shelter at local schools and public gyms. Roads, underpasses, buildings and bridges have been flooded. Parts of the Olympic Boulevard and the Nabu Expressway have also been blocked, though some parts were unblocked during the day. For a time, operation of Seoul's subway line 9 was suspended and stations on line 2, 3 and 7 have been submerged. Swimming pools at all Hangang River parks have also been closed and will remain closed until the weather improves. To minimize the damage, authorities are advising people to stay away from streams and rivers that are prone to flooding. They should also refrain from visiting mountainous regions where there is a risk of landslides. Also, those going out should use public transportation rather than driving. Top diplomats of Seoul and Beijing sat down for talks. The two sides clarified their stance on the escalating U.S.-China tensions stemming from Taiwan, as well as Washington's potential move to ostracize Beijing in global supply chains. South Korea and China must keep themselves independent and free from external obstacles and influences. That's coming from China's top diplomat Wang Yi on Tuesday, and then much heightened tension between Washington and Beijing over Taiwan, as well as the new Chief Four Semiconductor Alliance. 
The two sides should be aware of a win-win situation and secure a stable and smooth supply chain and industrial network. We must uphold equality and respect and not interfere in each other's internal affairs. Beijing is also aware of SARS's participation in the so-called CHIP4, the Washington-led semiconductor alliance involving Taiwan and Japan. This is something Beijing sees as nothing more than a grouping aimed at countering its influence in global supply chains. After meeting with Wang in Qingdao, China on Tuesday, South Korea's foreign minister once again crystallized the SARS stance, saying that his country will seek ways to beef up cooperation with China based on national interests and shared principles. I hope that South Korea and China cooperate for freedom, peace and prosperity around the world and in the Indo-Pacific region, beyond the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia, based on universal values. To further upgrade their strategic partnership, Bak voiced hope that Wang visits Korea within the year and that the Chinese leader does so too at a convenient time. Carried out in a much friendly atmosphere, Wang welcomed Bak's invitation, saying that he could come to Korea to eat Korean-style Chinese food. North Korea issues also topped Tuesday's talks, where Bak once again called on China to play its constructive role so that the regime comes back to dialogue instead of pursuing its military ambitions. Children's malnutrition has always been a problem in Afghanistan, but according to UNICEF Afghanistan, the situation has deteriorated over the past year under the Taliban's rule. It's not an infectious disease that hangs over many of the children at this hospital in Kabul. Instead, their parents share a similar story. They couldn't afford to feed their children properly, and all 40 beds at the malnutrition ward are full. Abeda is a mother of a 10-month-old baby. We are so upset, we feel depressed. Myself, his father, his sisters, we all feel very sad. My husband even said he wants to go to Iran to look for work because he feels ashamed that he can't afford to buy him medicine or milk. He said, my son is dying in front of my eyes, but I am not capable of doing anything. Children's malnutrition has always been a problem in Afghanistan. However, UNICEF Afghanistan says the situation has deteriorated over the past year under the Taliban's rule. The economy has collapsed and millions endure food shortages after troops withdrew. And the US and others cut off direct assistance that Afghanistan depended on. Its financial and humanitarian crises have only grown worse. Dr. Mohammed Ashraf has worked double shifts to help the growing number of patients. It is a fact that misery and poverty are increasing in our country day by day. The higher the poverty rates, the more malnutrition cases there are. I urge the international community and other assisting organizations to help the poor people, especially those suffering from malnutrition. The Taliban's treatment of girls and women is one of the main reasons why the international community refuses to recognize Afghanistan's new rulers, cutting off billions of dollars in aid and exacerbating an economic crisis. Senior officials at several ministries said that policies regarding women were set by top leaders and declined to comment further. The Taliban leadership has said all Afghans' rights will be protected within their interpretation of Sharia. UNICEF estimated 1.1 million Afghan children under the age of five are expected to suffer from severe malnutrition in 2022. This is UNICEF's chief of nutrition in the country, Melanie Galvin. Over the past year or so, there's no question the number of children who are severely malnourished has doubled. And I do not see those numbers improving. I see them getting worse. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. According to the Office of the UN High Commission for Human Rights, Ukraine has recorded over 12,000 civilian casualties, including 352 deaths among children between February and late July. The crisis caused the worst refugee situation in Europe since World War II. 
An aircraft made a crash landing into a California freeway hitting a truck before catching fire. The single engine Piper experienced engine failure when heading to a Corona Municipal Airport. About 4,000 beagles are looking for their forever homes after animal rescue organizations started removing the dogs from a facility in Cumberland, Virginia, which bred them to be sold to laboratories for animal experimentation. Japanese designer Aisei Miyake, famed for his pleated style of clothing that never wrinkles and who produced the signature black turtle neck of friend and Apple founder Steve Jobs, has died at the age of 84. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with iconic landmarks in Australia's Melbourne lighting up in pink to honour Melbourne-raised entertainer Olivia Newton-John, who died at the age of 73. Stay safe and have a good night.